everybody. <laughs> uh, welcome to the second of our Senior Scholar Series for this year. My pleasure to have Alejandro Bernal, a doctoral student in the Vancouver School of, uh, I don't know if they tell you, Vancouver School of Economics, to introduce our speaker tonight. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Senior Scholar Series at Green College. This time our guest is Professor Asher Codwell. Uh, Professor Codwell has a Bachelor in Electrical Engineering from the Institute of Technology at Mumbai, a Master in Science in Electrical Engineering from the University of Idaho, and a PhD in Economics from the University of Oxford. During his time as an academic, Professor Codwell has worked in topics related to economic development from a theoretical and empirical approach. His research has contributed to important questions such as the relationship of poverty in India with the growth in agricultural productivity, the role of credit in agrarian economies, the impact of economic liberalization in growth and poverty, and food security in India, among others. Currently, he is an emeritus professor at the Vancouver School of Economics, and for the last six years, he has been the editor-in-chief for the newsletters Ideas for India, where its mission is to enhance the quality of public debate in India by making the findings of academic research accessible to the lay public. Today, he is among us with that interdisciplinary mission of spreading the knowledge of economics to the lay public. I'm personally very interested in his research. I come from a field which is uh, international macroeconomics. That's my field of work. And I'm very interested in his uh, comments about developing economics. So join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Asher Kodawa. Uh, thank you very much, Alejandro. Um, now, um, before I started thinking about this talk, I don't think I had ever sat down to review the course of my life. You know, what, you know, what decisions I made, why did I make them, and so on. Um, you know, things just happen. And when something significant happens, it kind of leaves a story in your mind. And these stories become a guidepost for the course of your life. So I think it's all serendipity. Um, but I would like to share um, some of these stories that might explain to you what I did, why I did them, and so on. Now, um, I was born in a very ordinary family in Mumbai, which is now Bombay. Um, but my sister, who was 15 years older than me, was an idealist, and so was her husband. And they spent all their spare time working for an NGO that did a lot of work in the urban slums of Bombay, as well as uh, in the rural area outside. And they sort of, they, they had profound influence on the way I looked at the world. Um, I should also add that my brother-in-law, who kind of became my role model, was also a professor of economics. He taught in a local college in Mumbai. Uh, now, one of the things I really absorbed from them was that at least for a country like India, <clears throat> the poor are not responsible for their poverty. The upward mobility is so little that basically the accident of one's birth really determined the course of your life. And um, so I was always aware, I was made aware, I was aware that I was born lucky, I was lucky. I was lucky to be born in a middle class family with educated parents um, so that I could have opportunities and so on. And I also had this kind of imbibed this thing. Nobody told me exactly, but just the way people around me lived, that it was really bad form to try and claim 100% of the credit for gains which are attributable to pure luck. And so that was, uh, so th th anyway, that's, uh, now when I talk about poverty, um, <clears throat> I should give you some idea. I mean, rather than giving you numbers, I, <coughs> I can tell you a story that has really stayed embedded in my brain. Uh, this is when I was an undergraduate uh, uh, engineering student. 
and I was visiting this coastal village um, in a Kokan area in the west coast of India. Um, very beautiful place, a mountainous, uh, but extremely poor place because rain had washed away all the soil down to the sea and the land was very infertile. So the people who had left behind, who had left behind, who had not gone to the uh, city looking for jobs, were extraordinarily poor. And I saw the rural labor market in operation there. So, you know, a bunch of people, at the crack of dawn, a bunch of people would gather outside the local landlord's gate looking for work. <clears throat> and at some point, he would come out and say, um, you and you and you. He would pick three, four people from 10 or 12 people gathered there. Um, most of these people look quite emaciated. Now, some less so. And that's because I was told that you know, they had been in army or were fed better or something like this. But uh, what, what is really um, tragic are these vicious cycles in poverty, that he would typically pick people who had some meat on their bones, right? Because he wanted people who could do physical tasks. So even there, you could see that among, among the people who uh, needed it the most uh, had the last opportunities to get a job. And what is true of just physical strength and physical task is also true for <clears throat> skilled jobs and education. The poorest get the poorest kind of education and have the least opportunities uh, for getting the job. So this is kind of the nature of poverty uh, in India. And that was, uh, it, it was so, uh, um, so clear to me what uh, this meant. And then I would watch them. I would watch them work. So they would start work in the morning and then work, this is physical work, you know, dig a hole or uh, move a bush somewhere and so on. And uh, the, basically they would work till uh, noon and had a lunch break. But for many of them, there was no lunch in the lunch break. They would just drink water. The first meal would really come at the end of the day when they collected their wages, they would pick up some rice on the way home, right? And this is a picture that has really uh, stayed in my mind. But <clears throat> I'm sorry, I, I'm battling a bad cold, so my throat just runs dry out. I didn't want to be so poor. And I didn't have to be. I, I had educated parents. I had opportunities. I had education. And so, um, like a good middle, uh, middle class boy, I went to engineering school um, to Indian Institute of Technology, which was really uh, seemed to be producing graduates for the American market. Uh, the curriculum was American, the faculty was American trained. And when I graduated, and I worked there for a year uh, for IBM, a year and a half, and then uh, I saw most of my class uh, had basically departed for US. And pretty soon I followed suit. Um, so then I, then I was an engineer. I also got on the degree. I worked for five years in computer industry in Ma Massachusetts, Boston area. And one thing that always uh, 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 you know, struck me was the by just the very virtue of the fact that I happened to be living in the United States, my standard of living was so much higher than my good friend in high school who was much smarter than me. Right? So why are some countries rich and others have stayed poor? Um, anyway, so I, I kept thinking about it on and off. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I should uh, study some economics on my own. And then I went and bought some economics textbooks, and there's a lot of abracadabra. I couldn't really get into it. Um, and then one day, I, um, I, I, I knew nothing about economics. I'd never taken any course in economics. Um, but I thought, you know, Harvard must have a good economics department. So, um, so I called up, and I took appointment with the graduate chair, who was Professor Gralikas at that point. 
and I took an appointment, and he was kind enough to give me an appointment. And then I very, you know, in a naive sort of way, I felt very foolish afterwards. But I, I, you know, I told him I wanted to do, do graduate work in economics, and uh, and why. And I remember him sitting across the desk, uh, radically amazed. <laughs> and he says. Uh, so let me get this straight. You don't have an inkling what economics is all about, but you want to do PhD at Harvard to save India. <laughs> and I said, yeah. <laughs> um, so he said, look, I'll, I'll tell you what. Uh, I'll tell you a little secret. Um, you know, we don't teach economics from scratch at Harvard, okay? In fact, what most people don't know is none of the faculty here is that interested in undergraduate teaching at all. Most of them are busy doing research. So what we do is we hire really, we recruit uh, bright students from, uh, you know, universities across the world. We're well trained in economics and they learn from each other. So that's... <laughs> So stay away from Harvard. Okay. Um, he said, you know, just across the Charles River there, there's Boston University, and there are people there who um, worry about things like this. Why is India poor? Um, so I went to BU, and um, uh, they accepted me partly because I, I had experience in computer industry and they thought I would make a good RA. Uh, now, I went to BU, um, but I didn't quite like the brand of development economics they were teaching. There were a lot of people there who kind of went around to Africa and Latin America and so on, um, dispensing advice. And I never quite, it, it never made a lot of sense to me. I couldn't understand the reasoning behind it. Um, you know, very prescriptive, you know, sort of like homeopathic medicine, right? Uh, if you have balance of payment problem, take these sugar pills, you know. If you have inflation, take these other sugar pills, something like that. And it, it, it didn't really make sense. But at the same time, I quite liked the way economists thought that Economists, uh, I thought, you know, they, went, they didn't just stop at describing something. They tried to explain, right? And that was theory. And what we mean by explanation in economics is really that you explain a certain observed phenomena uh, in terms of a logical structure or a model that makes no random assumptions except some very primitive assumptions of human behavior, like... Um, people are self-interested. So you could kind of explain a whole lot of things just based on that. There are interaction of people who are self-interested, and, uh, and I, it appealed to me. Uh, it was fun do, doing this, right? And, uh, and, and I, I, I had a very uh, good uh, advisor who was not a development economist. He was actually a theorist. And uh, um, he kind of guided me along um, and I, uh, you know, despite, uh, I, actually, I never took development as a field in, uh, at BU. Um, so, so anyway, that, uh, now this was 75 to 1980, okay? So at that time, uh, you know, uh, laptops were not uh, 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 quite easily available. Computers were not that fast. You know, you had these big computers with cards and so on. So... Um, uh, the, uh, and maybe because because of that, you know, you didn't have a lot of data sets available. So the uh, kind of requirements for empirical work were nothing like they are now, okay? And in fact, what applied theory meant then was that, um, you know, you, you have a phenomena, you know, it, it's maybe anomalous, puzzling, it doesn't make sense, it's not obvious to you why such a thing exists. And... And then you put together a model or a tell a story, which actually, on the basis of very primitive assumptions on behavior, you can explain. And um, and then 
we, uh, you know, the empirical part was what we call stylized facts. Okay, so these are facts that people kind of agreed that mostly it exists. Everybody knows it exists, right? It wasn't hard data such, and so there was a lot of room for speculation, and that was half the fun actually, uh, because you could come up with stories, and that that was the enjoyable part of uh, doing work there in economics. That was that was the nature of applied theory. Now it's very different, and we'll see how, right? Um, so anyway, uh, uh, so now how, do, how did that connect to my concerns about India being poor and so on? At that point, I kind of uh, uh, figured that, you know, really, you don't, um, there are no easy solutions to development, um, and I didn't quite believe all these people uh, who are consultants here and there. I think the, um, economic progress of a country very much depended on the kind of institutions it had, and you had to understand the institutions. And at that time, especially in Indian agriculture, there were institutions which seemed pre-modern and looked nothing like the institutions in developed countries. And so, <clears throat> uh, you know, they were puzzled. The people were puzzling about it. Social scientists were talking about it. And um, uh, what I enjoyed doing in my thesis is really trying to um, explain them in terms of just mainstream economics, what seemed like uh, semi-feudal um, institutions and uh, which m made no sense. And I quite enjoyed um, uh, doing it. So after my PhD, I came to UBC. Why did I come to UBC? And partly the uh, credit uh, goes to uh, Truce, my wife, who's, fr who's Dutch, and she was looking for kind of a rainy green place <laughs> to set <laughs> um, So anyway, so, and then I, I came to UBC and, uh, and I really never had any regrets. It, it turned out to be great. In fact, it turned out to be the best economics department in the country. I didn't know that actually. I came because she said, that's where we should go. Um, when I, when I came to UBC, then I hooked up with my colleague, uh, Mukesh Swaran, um, who had similar interests and complementary skills. And we did a lot of work together. And uh, so it, it was along the same lines. He was also interested in uh, India. He was interested in poverty and inequality and issues of this sort. Right? So the first question, like, you know, um, why are some countries rich while others have stayed poor? Well, you know. To try to understand what has been the process. Uh, I mean, if you go before the Industrial Revolution, the whole world was poor, right? And uh, before the uh, you know uh, Industrial Revolution, most people, most of the labor force, was really engaged in agriculture, producing the the basic need, the food, the food right? Um, and first of all, one thing you do see right away is um, uh, you know, the people, have, economists have known this for a long time, um, something called Engels' Law, that, you know, when income increases, people spend smaller and smaller portion of their income on food, right? And so, um, uh, certainly when you're very poor, you're spending uh, quite a large proportion of your income on food, right? And that's uh, in, in agriculture. So, of course, when uh, if food becomes cheap, the poor benefit a lot, right? That, that's, uh, that's quite clear. Um, now, I mean, maybe I should tell you a story which I always tell my students. Uh, uh, they have heard it a million times, but uh, I'll, I'll, only a few of them are here, so they, I don't mind. <laughs> um, so uh, no, this, is, this is just to kind of uh, bring home the point how um, uh, you know, uh, in a way, the Engels laws, right? How, why that is important, and um, why make you know why increasing productivity in agriculture, right? Which is um, making food cheaper, uh, uh, is uh, very very important. So this is a uh, this is when I was working. I was doing some project in you know, a in a little village. Um, a very, very poor village, uh, about 80 miles off uh, Bombay. And um, uh, I was uh, 
you know, I was full of questions. I, I wanted to understand their rural economy, you know, what they grow, what kind of prices they get, what kind of wages they pay, and so on. So. And then they were very patiently answering all my questions. And then uh, at some point, one of them said, uh, you know, you're asking us a lot of questions. What did they know about me? All they knew about me was that I come from some very rich place which is in America, and America is very rich. So Canada was some place in America, and it's very rich. And I was an Indian, and I, I was there, and you know, so, that, so that's what they wanted to understand a little bit about the place that I came from. Um, and then um, I said, sure. And then they kind of uh, went into a huddle, and um, uh, somebody would propose a question, and they said, no, no. So they were looking for a question that would be really, that would reveal a lot to them about the place. I came from this very rich place. And then I could see their heads nodding, they kind of reached a consensus. And what was the question? The question was, what is the price of rice in your country? <laughs> okay. And I was completely floored because I didn't have a clue. <laughs> I mean, these people lived or died by price of rice. When I walk through a grocery store, I toss a bag in my trolley, and I never look at the price because it forms such a small part of my total budget. And that was the difference, right? I was rich, they were poor. The uh, price of rice was of great importance to them. And in fact, that's when I learned that what development is all about is when price of rice becomes irrelevant to you. And uh, so anyway, so this is... So this kind of uh, was uh, uh, very much uh, part of our thinking, you know, the, how important the <coughs> agriculture productivity is. So you can see when the agriculture productivity grows, then the few people can produce food for the rest of the society. So it can release labor and they can go and do other things. And that's after industrial revolution, right? It says then there are, there are more activities, there are more ways of doing it. Incomes are increasing and uh, demand for other things are increasing. And uh, when the labor is released, because these people are um, increasing the food production, so first of all, uh, uh, when the, pr uh, the relative price of food goes down uh, in terms of wages, the poor directly become better off. Plus, there is a process where uh, labor is drawn from agriculture, which is on fixed land, to other activities, right? So the burden on land diminishes, right? Before you had so many people working on the same piece of land. Now maybe just half of them or one fourth of them. And uh, so if you see the history of uh, nations, what you see is that um, uh, as countries grow uh, more and more prosperous, the percentage of labor force in agriculture diminishes. And even, even the labor, even the land surplus countries like Canada or the US, you see very small part, 2%, 3%, uh, who make their living of agriculture, right? Because we are a developed country. You go to the poorer countries, there will be some, uh, 60 percent, 70 percent. Even India, even today, it's 50 percent. And th that time, in the 60s and 70s, the miracle economies were these kind of Asian tigers, like Korea and South Korea and uh, Taiwan and so on. And then. Um, the contrast was quite visible that, you know, um, well, one of the two, two main pillars of their strategy, one was they put a lot of emphasis on increasing agriculture productivity, and the other was they actually uh, found uh, markets for their labor-intensive manufacturers to export, right? So that they, they were not constrained by the domestic demand, and they could move their labor rapidly from agriculture to industries which would produce these labor-intensive goods and export them. India, on the other hand, had very little emphasis, had put very little emphasis on agriculture, increasing agriculture productivity, and had operated pretty much a closed economy that they had, uh, uh, they had uh, minimized uh, in, uh, uh, trade to the extent that was possible, right? And so putting all this together, uh, Mukesh and I created a framework, and then um, we, we wrote a, a few papers, and uh, finally a book called why poverty persists in India. Um, so uh, th that was one thing, but of course, you know, this rich and poor countries, but there's also kind of this 
uh, generic problems, right? Like uh, um, really interesting grand issues which have um, uh, uh, which have been with, with us for a long time. Class structure, existence of class structure, right? Um, or why does capital hire labor, not the other way around? Why doesn't labor hire capital instead in, in production? Um, I mean, this is something we take for granted. Capital, of course, capital would hire labor rather than why, and then it gets a little complicated. So um, now, uh, just around, just before that, there had been kind of a, um, revolution in economics of, uh, of our, at least a uh, lot of new work in economics, which. Uh, um, which was based on the fact that uh, uh, information between interacting agents is asymmetrically shared. Like, you know, when bank lends money to a firm, the firm knows very well the risks involved, the, the creditor, the uh, bank doesn't, right? Or uh, even in a labor contract, the, the manager doesn't know the quality of effort the worker is putting in, right? So there was, there was this uh, uh, whole lot of literature coming around that. and. Um, the, 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 we, we wrote a paper called um, Why Are Capitalists the Bosses? And uh, again, it, it sounds very Marxist, right? But in fact, it was straight mainstream economics based on sort of asymmetric information. How do labor markets work? How do credit markets work? And as a result, how do you get a class structure? Uh, uh, the, there, was, there, was a, there was another thing which... Uh, uh, we, uh, we quite enjoyed doing, which was like, I mean, think of, think of this, right? The two babies are born at the same time. And how do we know whether this baby will be the boss and this baby will be, go and work for him, okay? Now, if everything else was equal, we would say, well, you know, it's a matter of talent. Like, yeah, if somebody is more, um, uh, has greater initiative, is more innovative, uh, uh, can uh, do things better, more intelligent, would become the boss, and the other person would work for him. But everything else is not equal. And um, so, uh, you know, so, so in many ways, people who have um, access to credit have a big advantage. And the access to credit really comes from your initial conditions, to some extent. I remember there was a graffiti scribbled by some UBC, irate UBC student in the library, uh, UBC library uh, here. And it said that uh, banks give you loans only when you prove to them that you don't need any, okay? What is that? That's collateral, right? That you need collateral. Without collateral, is, is hard to do, right? And so, um, so we explored at, uh, 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 various angles about you know, the importance of this and what kind of class structure does it lead to, right? For the one, uh, one other example, right? Like, think, think of it uh, that there's a farmer, and like any, you know, and every entrepreneur actually has this kind of ups and downs like farmers have. So if some, some years are good, some years are bad. So now, uh, when you are kind of, you know, close to subsistence, in a bad year, you get killed, right? You basically, uh, it's, it could be starvation, right? Um, but if you have a cookie jar, that in a good year, you put some cookies in the cookie jar. In bad years, you help yourself to cookies from the cookie jar. You're not so afraid of the risk of going down, right? So, it, uh, so access, no, credit, access to credit is very much like a cookie jar. That if you, uh, and the cookie jar doesn't have to be yours. If your friend, allows access, allows you access to his cookie jar, you will still manage to stabilize your consumption over time, right? That you can, and then you're not so afraid of taking risk. And if you're not taking, afraid of taking risk, you're more likely to venture into something like being an entrepreneur and things like this. So there are various ways that this kind of initial conditions play um, uh, and, 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 and uh, create a, a class structure. So, um, yeah, and then we also, uh, other part of the income inequality story is also uh, the, the trickle down, right? Now, um, you know, trickle down is this idea that, uh, you know, rising tide uh, lifts all boats. Now, um, I mean, to some extent it's true, but how much, right? Um, 
Now, just think of it like what what happens, what happens when um, we have growth of the kind we are having now, skill intensive growth, right? So people who are skilled are higher income people, and skill intensive growth means those people, you know, the, in those sectors where uh, skills are important, they grow faster. So the growth is, if the growth accrues largely to people with skills, right, then how would trickle down work? The trickle down would work because as their incomes go up, it depends on what are they spending it on, right? Um, th think of the present day India, for example. Uh, uh, over the last several decades, India has had very fast growth, but the growth was really based on um, industries like software, business services, highly skill intensive uh, sectors, right? In fact, very few people. Now those people experienced a huge lift in their incomes, right? But now what are they going to spend it on? I mean, they, you know, a, a, a manager or a software um, uh, engineer in Bangalore working for Infosys, when they experience, they get an export contract, they experience uh, growth in their income, they already have a driver, they already have a cook, they already have an ayah and so on, cleaning lady, right? They're not going to have two of them, right? They will basically, uh, typically when incomes of higher income uh, people go up, they don't necessarily buy more things, they buy higher quality things, okay? And to the extent, so first of all, higher quality things are produced by more skilled people. And to, to some extent, again, uh, this, this, you know, the trickle down, the strength of the trickle down would depend upon if the, the, those who are experiencing income growth are spending it on the kind of things that a large mass of unskilled people who are poor uh, can produce, right? And uh, that, that, uh, uh, that uh, um, bond becomes weaker and weaker as, as this growth starts accruing to the, the stock classes. And actually, we did, um, I, I, I remember very fondly a paper I did with my colleague uh, Brian Copeland, which kind of uh, uh, captures this uh, a little bit. Of course, there, instead of two classes, there are two countries and so on, and the trade between them breaks down. But uh, so, th so this was sort of uh, um, my years of uh, uh, applied theory. But economics has, economics has evolved. Uh, uh, and, and it's a good thing, right? Uh, uh, with, um, uh, you know, computers became uh, cheap, faster, uh, uh, data sets, a lot more data sets become available, and, uh, and the empirical requirements grew, and that, that's, that's really a good thing. Um, it's uh, uh, the kind of uh, applied theory that I did would no longer sell. You know, we can't talk about stylized facts. The facts and the facts are in data, and you actually look at data, and it's really a good thing, I think. Um, so, so the, 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 uh, I mean, what had, well, uh, you know, what's good about it is you can't basically you can't uh, speculate wildly. What's bad about it is you can't speculate wildly. <laughs> uh, but uh, so you lose some. Now, you know, uh, I, I see one of the things I, I often find in seminars and so on, that it's, it's a good thing that we've become empirically rigorous, but um, um, many times I find that the emphasis is far too much on econometric methodology than the underlying economic story. Um, and that's, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's a bit of a pity. Um, I, I, enjoyed speculating. Um, so th that's one uh, way economics has evolved uh, in the kind of uh, um, applied theory now is really uh, theory plus empirics. And the second way is that um, economics has become much more open to insights from other social sciences. Um, uh, you know, uh, the insights from psychology has created this uh, exciting new world of behavioral economics. Um, 
political science was always an adjacent kind of field to economics, and now economics is really going back to its root in, roots in political economy. Um, and even sociology, like there are lots of, we, we now um, understand that uh, you know, when we are really trying to understand how the world works, uh, uh, there's a lot of wisdom also in sociology that you, e e economists can use. And so it, it, the field has become richer and uh, uh, therefore it's uh, actually explanatory power has gone up. Now, um, um, you know, it's the, it's the life cycle of, uh, uh, of an academic that, uh, um, you know, you get old, fields evolve, you become rusty, and then your students become your teachers. And it's a good thing. And uh, 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 so, so just to uh, give you the, the two of my, uh, two, two, two students who did PhD with me, who are now my colleagues, and I learn a great deal from them now. Um, uh, my uh, last project is, uh, illustrates that, right? Now, uh, it's kind of interesting. So here, uh, yeah, what I should say is this, right? Shivan Anderson was born and raised in Canada. I was born and raised in India. I was always aware that caste is important. But I learned from her that to understand even governance, even the uh, institutions in India, you had to take caste into account very seriously, right? And um, so our last project actually, uh, an example of this, here the issue was this, that, uh, um, you know, there, there have been many experiments uh, in uh, uh, democratic designs of polity in India. Um, and the power has been devolved to the local governments, the village governments. Um, and the formal design of institutions seems okay that, you know, that the idea is that, you know, you uh, allow the local population to elect a local government and give them uh, resources to do what they want, right? True democracy. Elections take place quite regularly, fairly, mostly fairly. Um, people vote in large numbers, uh, in astoundingly large numbers. And yet, the resources that the government has earmarked for the poor, like many poverty alleviation schemes, are underutilized. They don't get used. Now, if the poor are in majority and they're electing the people, why is it that their resources which are available, they don't have to raise these resources, resources made available by central government are not being used? So that was the question. And we, uh, the, 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 this project that I am about to describe had all these elements, like, like um, the empirical work and um, uh, taking into account things like cost and so on. Uh, we um, had a, um, primary survey where we surveyed, uh, interviewed 9,000 households from 300 villages, right, in India, trying to really understand uh, what, what went on. We didn't, you know, there were no real stylized facts here. These are facts, there's data. And, um, uh, and the, the really what our finding uh, was, was that basically, uh, Modern institutions, however well designed formally, are manipulated by the local elite, the, the, uh, the, 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 the kind of hierarchical caste structure that has existed for generations. So the local elite who are actually, um, uh, you know, the part of a dominant peasant caste, uh, they, had, uh, uh, they had overwhelming influence on the way things ran for, uh, for a very long time. And they didn't relinquish this influence. They actually, um, uh, because, because these people, the, uh, the local villagers, the poor, depended so much on this local elite for various things, for credit, for uh, other help, that they had some kind of patron-client relationship uh, through which um, they manipulated the decisions of the local govern, uh, governing bodies, like panchayats, like village councils. 
um, to make sure that the bargaining position of the agriculture labor does not rise, so that labor stays compliant and um, uh, the wages stay low, right? Um, now, you know, it, 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 was, it was very interesting to, by the way, you know, this thing, going there, talking, I mean, uh, we didn't do all the surveys ourselves, but we did some pilot surveys and uh, just going uh, 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 through this area. I remember uh, once I gave a talk at University of Toronto, and this is, this is my earlier um, um, uh, applied theory days, um, when I was presenting some story with a theoretical model, and it was a very neat model, and then um, uh, somebody from the audience, one of the faculty members, um, uh, said approvingly, actually, that you know, this goes to show that you don't have to go and get the century to do development economics. <laughs> and now I think he was wrong. You do. <laughs> you do have to get the century to do this. Um, so anyway, but now, if, if uh, what do you do under these circumstances that, you know, if you have, um, uh, if you have this uh, kind of um, well-designed institution, but it still gets sabotaged by sort of this age-old power structure, what do you do? The local elite uh, are manipulating, right? And one solution that comes to your mind is that um, maybe have a technological solution, right? Just bypass the local elite. If the government, central government, wants to help uh, the poor, the poverty elevation scheme, have direct cash transfers, which just completely bypass. Well, cash transfers, how? Well, you know, open bank accounts in, the, um, the, in their names uh, for the targeted beneficiaries. Well, how do you do that? Like, a lot of these people, they are amorphous. They're, you know, they're thousands just going from rural areas to the cities, and they don't have fixed addresses. They don't have identity cards. They don't have driver's license, right? How do you, um, and, and so one solution came along, which was biometric identification. And it was a big project in India where over a billion people were given biometric identification. So you just your uh, fingerprints and your iris, right? And that's unique data, right? Uh, unique to you, and you can just use that almost as an identity card, and then you can open an account uh, in uh, the name of this person who carries this data. Um, and then just send cash transfers. And it was a very seductive solution. I, I was um, uh, very much swayed by this. Lots of my friends, my economics friends, academic, they, um, and we actually um, petitioned. The, we, we had an open letter to the prime minister, so on. We really tried that because the present system um, of giving, you know, actually food rations or subsidized food and so on, too cumbersome, right? There's too much waste and too much leakage, lots of corruption and so on. So this would be much better, we thought. And, um, and I remember actually um, having kind of a public debate. Yeah, you know, last several years, I've been more and more engaged with sort of uh, in, 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 uh, in public debates in India on various policies. And um, uh, most of my economics friends, right, from North America and so on, were to totally with me, like, yeah, you know, technological solution. And the person who really argued with us is a, a very unique individual called John Drez. He's a Belgian economist who's called India his home. He works in the, in the poorest areas in India. He's a really good economist, but, um, uh, you know, he works, you know, unlike the uh, um, uh, rest of us who work in the Ivy Tower, he actually works at the grassroots level, he's an activist. But his economic arguments are never that bad, you know, they're they always co compelling. So we couldn't understand why he was opposed, and he kept saying, no, you know, like, this will not work in India. India is not ready for it, doesn't have infrastructure. Didn't quite understand. And then, uh, finally, the government has been moving along uh, in this direction anyway, and they, then they, they started doing this. In some of the backward areas, the results were disastrous. And this is where I kind of learned that, you know, even at my ripe old age, I can't stop making huge blunders, right? That this is where we really argue. And, uh, and finally, looking at the actual 
evidence of what happened, John was completely right. Uh, that he basically, they're not yet ready. There's, you know, like, imagine what happens here is that you have to depend upon a good online connection. So you give your data that's connected to some central data bank, and it verifies you as person X, right? The damn signal doesn't work in the hinterland. <laughs> There's simple things like that, right? And in fact, uh, the exclusion errors, the people who were excluded from getting, uh, was as, 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 as big as 5%, right? Which is large number of people. And in fact, the, the, in the poorest areas where they needed the most, they, the, 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 the um, uh, errors were the highest, right? So, um, and then John wrote this article, which has uh, really, I, I circulate this to my uh, stu students, who said that, you know, academic, econo academic researchers should work hand in hand with some of the social activists. Because uh, if, you, if, you, if you're thinking about policy conclusions, really, um, grassroots level knowledge is important. Just practical things, how things work, how they don't work. Um, okay, so so far I have I have not um, I, you know this was mostly I talked about my research I haven't um, said much about teaching you know when you come to retirement age I know that a lot of us kind of become wary of undergraduate teaching you know the classes are big and students complain too much and this sort of stuff. But I was incredibly lucky, like in 2012, um, I got what you can call manna from the heaven, which was a, a, a Vancouver School of Economics created a new program called Bachelor of International Economics. And I was asked to direct it. And I was, you know, I was not sure how it was going to turn out. But it has turned out wonderfully well. The, this, this, uh, you know, we took like um, about um, 80 um, students, highly selected. They, they were like uh, over 2,700 applications for 80 students. And um, 40 of them were Canadian, and other 40 international students from 23 different countries, right? And they go together as a cohort. And uh, these are students who are intellectually curious. They are. Um, resourceful, um, they are just a joy to teach, right? And um, in fact, uh, uh, this competition, our department to really teach BIE students rather than anybody because they, they want to learn. And, uh, um, and I just adore them. So it was, a, so for last uh, several years, I mean, I have uh, enjoyed my teaching, but mostly I've been teaching in the BIE uh, uh, for the last six years or so. And um, uh, really having a good time at it. Um, yeah, one thing I did not, um, um, uh, I, I, I did not dwell on. I was also uh, head of economics for five years, um, and you know, even that wasn't that bad. I mean, our department. <laughs> first of all, our department is. Um, it's really a good department. It's, it's not that difficult to manage, you know. But I had no idea that this sort of responsibility would fall on me. Uh, I, I never thought I would be up for it. But, you know, once you have to do it, you just do it. And then you realize that, gee, I can do this. It's not bad. I mean, I survived for, for, for five years. Um, and also, you, you know, I think I've learned a lot just about myself and about human nature in general. Um, it, it is a kind of a strange job because uh, you are nobody's boss, but you have a boss, that's the dean, right? And um, so you, um, uh, you, you develop skills that you never had before. <laughs> uh, Evan knows. <laughs> um, Anyway, so this is basically my story. Um, and really, when I think about it, I think I've been so incredibly lucky. 
Um, I, I had the best of colleagues. I have wonderful friends and adorable students. Um, yeah, so, and, you know, then I'm teaching at, at UBC, um, the, the best department, best economics department in Canada, situated in the prettiest city in the world, maybe, which is in perhaps the most humane country of all. So, yeah, I, I guess I've been extremely lucky and grateful. Um, I suppose my epitaph should be, she's one lucky guy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>